Hello, Peter here. Unfortunately, the capture software that we used uh, to conduct the interview for this podcast didn't work as we intended. We're sorry about this. Um, so in order to give it a proper send off, we have included a special audio bite for you. Thanks for listening and please enjoy this episode of The Mog. I was surprised by this movie in many ways. I have to say, <laughs> I was regretting my decision. I, I think this would be something I'd say to my kids. Oh, that's good to hear. I think it's about a father's love for his child. Oh, absolutely, yes. And uh, a complete stranger's love for that man's child. They wore really <laughs> ugly outfits. <laughs> you know, puke yellow, prom night, pale blue, you know. Uh, I don't even know <laughs> yeah. where to start Definitely with this film. Definitely not a movie I would consider watching unless you tell me to. Hello, I'm Derek. And I'm Peter. And this is The Mog. In this podcast, one of us suggests a beloved movie for the other to watch. And then we talk about it. What made us laugh? What made us cry? And whether or not it explains our fear of spoons. <laughs> um, cut your heart out with a spoon. <laughs> and um, what movie have we got today? Wait up, Peter. This is a guest mog. With yeah, oh yeah, that's right. With journalist, writer, and performer, and mother of kittens, Natalie Behensky. Welcome, Natalie. Welcome. Thank you. Hooray! I'm so pleased to be here. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming. Super yeah, exciting. Yeah, I really appreciate it. It's always good to have professionals on the on the show. Oh goodness, <laughs> I'm not sure about that. Well, it'll be it'll encourage more people to actually listen to us, like listen to what, this episode at least. <laughs> so, what movie uh, have you picked for us? Natalie? I have picked for you because you asked me to pick a movie that was a defining movie of my childhood, and not only is this movie a defining movie of my childhood, but really of my life. And many people have criticized me for loving this movie as hard as I do, but I don't care. <laughs> Those people can all go jump in a lake. Uh, very similar to what one character says to another at one point in this film. This is the classic 1991 Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. That is the movie I have chosen for you. I, I am smiling even as I tell you that I chose this movie because it's great. <laughs> I'm so glad it's you did. It's amazing. I can't stress <laughs> this, enough how much... This, this is one of Peter's films. Ah, okay. <laughs> well, yeah. it's good to have... Yeah, on his it's list. It's good to have people on side. Um, this movie is just generally regarded really poorly by a lot of people and it's not fair and it's not kind and uh, it's rude and it's just intolerant uh, for people to hate on this film. They, they don't understand. They just don't understand. I mean, this this film is about community and about <laughs> understanding and about bringing peoples together. So, I mean, anyone who turns down this film because of American accents just doesn't understand the theme of the film. Well, can we address that? Let's Close-minded bigots. Let's talk about that. That is the elephant in the room and... <laughs> Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves is um, Kevin Costner, 1991. I think it was filmed just as he became huge with Dances with Wolves. So he'd been a successful leading man in the 80s. But Dances with Wolves, which he, of course, you know, directed and I think wrote as well, but he was hugely involved in that. Mm. And he won multiple Oscars, Riding High, and this was kind of the next big blockbuster film that he was in. So um, it's the story of Robin Hood reimagined as um, rather than Errol Flynn style Robin Hood in tights, but in contemporary clothing with more contemporary politics and, you know, l less merry men dancing about the forest. So <laughs> now having said that, I'm a huge fan of the Errol Flynn Adventures of Robin Hood uh, from 1939. And Errol Flynn if you ever read anything about Errol Flynn, is one of the worst people to ever oh, walk yeah, I know. God's green earth. He <laughs> is, was a terrible... He is a sociopath. <laughs> terrible man. And um, the dollop, I think, recently did a great... Uh, when they were in Brisbane, they did Errol Flynn. And, it, yeah. it, you know, he, he's just the worst person. It's an eye If I can tell you a funny story, just as an aside, I remember having a family dinner uh, when I was younger, you know, late teens or something, and talking about Errol Flynn. And my mother had been reading a book. Uh, my mother and I both always enjoyed sort of old Hollywood wood books and stuff like that and she just my mother is a very shy very proper lady I don't know how much you can sort of swear on this podcast of yours so I'll try to edit it uh, as much and, as you like uh, oh okay <laughs> well I'll say it but feel free to put a beep in but I do apologize for people who are of sensitive ears but this, you've got to imagine my mother very proper very shy very polite woman very very proper 
and I was talking about Errol Flynn and she turned to me and said, oh, well, Errol Flynn, he really was a cunt. (laughs) And and I just lost it because to hear that from my mother was just extraordinary. Oh, my gosh. Um, Oh, gosh. That was just hilarious. So, but, I mean, I'm a huge fan of that movie. I'm a huge fan of Olivia de Havilland, who, of course, was in a lot of films with Errol Flynn. She played Mae Marion. And that was a great adventure film for the 30s. It really did a great job. But it kind of stereotyped this myth that all Robin Hood films, he was in green tights and, um, you know, dashing through the forest and a bunch of merry men. And, with the pointy green uh, hat. And, and, of course, that never really was the case. You know, Men in Tights, which Mel Brooks, of course, then did to satirise the Robin Hood genre, really played up the whole men in tights thing. But so Mm. many Robin Hoods were actually quite gritty in their own way. There was a film, which I haven't seen, but um, in the 70s with Sean Connery and... Audrey Hepburn called Robin and Marion and it was about Robin coming back from war and Marion's gone into a convent and it's about them as older people not as the kind of young dashing couple but as older middle-aged people dealing so um, that's actually a film I want to seek out and watch so I think that there have been a lot of contemporary takes on the Robin Hood myth and it's been reimagined for a lot of different audiences and I think probably the most famous example of that in recent times was there was a BBC serial in the late 2000s called Robin Hood in which I think they kind of gave them all Doc Martens and leather jackets and <laughs> sort of made them trendy oh, wow. uh, like they were a, like they were a street gang, but oh, in the 1200s, right. you know. Uh. Um, I haven't actually watched that series. And then, of course, famously, Russell Crowe was going to reinvent the legend again with his film yeah. where he was going to play the Sheriff of Nottingham and kind of reverse it. So Nottingham was the good guy fighting this terrible outlaw and re- you know, kind of shake the tree on the Robin Hood legend. Yeah. But I think what happened was Russell Crowe just started demanding, no, 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 he can't be this, he can't be this, and eventually went, actually, you know what, let's just do a Robin Hood movie and I'll play Robin Hood. Um, <laughs> but even that, even that had its own interesting element in that it was... They always have a twist on it. It's always based around the current themes of the period, isn't it? That was my... like. Um, I think there was a conversations with Richard Feidler where he spoke to a historian about... Uh, the the myth of Robin Hood and how it's changed over time depending on the period. Yeah, that would make a lot of sense. Yeah, it's a very interesting story that just, just seems to constantly evolve. Yeah, it does. And um, there's actually a Robin Hood film, I think, in production at the moment, a new one, featuring as Maid Marian, get this, Bono's daughter. Oh, wow. Okay. So Bono from U2 has a daughter who's about 25. She's an actor and she's playing Maid Marian. Oh and I God. just went, so she was born in 1991, <laughs> the year that this film came out. Mm. And I tell you what, if you want to feel old like I do now, is is realise that this film that was such an important, because I was 10 when I saw this film, mm. and it made such a huge impact on me, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. And to think now that there's a, a, a girl who was either just being born or a baby when this film came out. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> makes me feel so old. Yeah. Um, and she's look, 25. I, can... I'm, I was 11. <laughs> so... Yeah, I, well, I was um, I was born in 1980, so um, I was just about to turn 11 oh, um, right. when, yeah, this, yeah. when this film came out. So, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves is a, re- a relatively traditional take on the um, on the story in the sense that it's Robin of Loxley who comes back to his family home after being on crusade, and it's been taken over by the sheriff of Nottingham. Yeah. Um, where it differs is in it involves devil worshipping. That's true, and, isn't and it? And I do want to talk about this a bit because this was actually sanitized and it was only coming to the film many years later and I'm talking within the last sort of 10 years. They reissued it with the new edit. When they issued it with all the extra stuff put in um, that you realise just how much of this film and, 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 when, and knowing now how I saw it, as a kid, I didn't realise all those layers. I didn't understand why they were standing in front of an upside-down cross and why the witch was doing all these curses. Like, I just thought, oh, it makes sense. You're a bad guy. You have a witch. Yeah. So <laughs> You're a bad guy. Um, You're definitely into Satan. <laughs> He's the right guy for you. <laughs> so the other difference with this Robin Hood version is that the Sheriff of Nottingham is the ultimate bad guy. It doesn't have the Prince John figure. So oh, that's true, yeah. In the usual Robin Hood legend, Prince John is the one who usurps the throne while Richard, his brother, is away at the Crusades and his henchman is often Sir Guy of Gisborne. So in the Errol Flynn movie, Sir Guy of Gisborne was the bad guy that Robin Hood eventually had to defeat. Prince John was the evil, you know, usurper. But the Sheriff of Nottingham was a kind of ridiculous character 
Mm. a bit of a pompous buffoon. And that sometimes holds through and Guy of Gisborne is in, – in the BBC series I was just talking about, Guy of Gisborne was kind of the big bad as well um, or he was kind of the sexy bad guy, you know, wore leather. Doesn't work I, here. I, <laughs> uh, so that was really interesting is that they dispensed with Prince John. And you know what? I actually really appreciate this because if you know your history, you know, the Robin Hood stories always ended up with Prince John, you know, thrown into jail or whatever – but he won in the end. Richard died on campaign <laughs> and John became the king. And he was a terrible king. He's regarded as one of England's. I'm, I'm a huge student of British history, I have to say. Oh, nice. You know, this is why I know this stuff. But And this is part of, you know, part of the reasons I love it so much is, is films like this that really got me into it. But King John is known as, as one of the worst kings in British history. He lost huge swathes of territory. Um, and it was only due to the fact that his son was a baby when he died that I think he was allowed to stay as, as the monarch because he was a baby, they could influence him. Right. So his son became a great king, Henry III, um, but Prince John himself was, was terrible. And so all these Robin Hood stories that end up with Prince John being kind of sent, you know, given the boot, it's not how history happened, you know. Wow. Richard And Richard the Lionheart is always praised as this amazing king of England. Do you know how long he spent of 12 years that he was king? Do you know how long he spent in England? Nine months. Oh, nice. nice. He was always on crusade. So he was not a good, he was a very charismatic king and all of that stuff, but he spent his kingship off in the Holy Lands and in France. Well, I guess, I guess um, having him absent is better than having a bad king so that is true uh, that's probably why he was seen much better than john it was a good comparison yeah but anyway i'm getting too distracted by history now um why i love this film so there were two films released in 1991 yeah i know there were about two. robin hood <laughs> so the other one is patrick bergen i think and uma thurman was made marion oh wow <laughs> nice a young Uma Thurman was made Marion. So in that one, he was just a guy and it had a lot of um, Saxon v. Norman type stuff in it. So Robin Hood was a Saxon earl and he was rising up against, you know, the Sheriff of Nottingham who was from the Norman. So if you know, again, if you know your British history, William the Conqueror and the Normans took over in 1066. And then there was sort of a couple of hundred years where there was a class structure where the native Saxons were kind of second class citizens. Mm. And eventually, through the kind of fusing of the English language, those classes ended up disappearing by, you know, 1400 uh, or the late 1300s, I should say. Um, but, yeah, the, it, it, was, it was a really interesting take on it because you've got these class divides. And he was a, 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 just a Saxon called Robert Hode, but his name was so hard to pronounce that everyone ended up calling him Robin Hood, Robin Hood, Robin Hood. So it was a play on words. Whereas the Kevin Costner one stuck... Yeah, Kevin Costner stuck with the traditional Robin of Loxley, nobleman, comes home. They didn't really do anything about Saxons v. Normans. They just went straight for um, prodigal son. Mm. And, you know, if we can address the elephant in the room, if you listen to the DVD commentary, which I haven't done for some years, but I remember very, very, very sharply that it was the director and Kevin Costner talking about the fact why he didn't do an American accent, why he didn't do an English accent. And the thing is, he did. Yeah, at the very beginning. <laughs> when they started filming, when they started filming, he was doing his scenes with an English accent. An English courage. The yeah. problem was he wasn't good at it. And so it sounded worse. And so they said it just sounds terrible. And if we if we do it with an American accent, it's not going to sound fantastic but it's going to sound better than you doing a shitty <laughs> English accent. Amazing. And you know what? I respect that. <laughs> yeah. I respect that. Well, like it's it's the way that Hollywood works, or at least certainly back then, you know, you need your big name marquee stars yeah. to pull in the people. So, of course, you're going to – you want Kevin Costner, you want him being – you know, the Robin Hood story is an English story, but it's so translatable to really all of Western culture and, you know, the fact that we have – rob from the rich, give to the poor. It's such a big um, narrative thread through a lot of stories that we, we have over the mm. years. So, it, it, you know, to get Americans on side, which, you know, is the audience they're trying to get, then let your American actor use his American accent. It really didn't bug me. Same thing with Christian Slater. He, he's, you know, he's got his full-on California, <laughs> oh, I know, like, great. hey, Robin Hood, how <laughs> well, do you, know, man? You well, know, what I've decided is that it's actually not an American accent. It's an accent of Loxley. Oh, 
So that area ah. is just, oh, that's okay. the actual accent of the area. <laughs> It's a dialect. Yeah, he took elocution lessons, I think, Brian Blessed is his father's character, uh, but everyone else just inherited oh. the Loxley accent. Can we say, can we just take a moment to praise, you know, whatever entity or science or whatever you want to do that Brian Blessed exists? Oh my god, he's uh, just amazing. His he, voice his voice just has, adds something to everything. Oh. <laughs> he's got a gorgeous accent. He, he could say he could say drivel. He could not even speak uh, a coherent sentence and it would sound like Shakespeare. I think the word in the movie was potentate. Oh gosh, it was arousing. <laughs> Let me you know, elucidate for you exactly how impressive it is. Is he's on screen for about two minutes, if that. The bulk of yeah. what he says is a voiceover. You just see him writing a letter, and then you hear him narrating it. I think he yeah. only says one line uh, or two lines. One to Duncan, I think, and then he says. For England and charges <laughs> into a mass assembly of devil worshippers yep. who proceed to burn him. Doesn't do now, very well. Not huge not... impact. He does not. He's on screen for two minutes. Massive impact. Just a massive well, that, impact. It's that so that was good. almost going to be Sean Connery, the the father. Was it? So yeah, um, he turned it down because he'd done too many father roles already. <laughs> So um, okay. so he ended up being the king. Yeah, <laughs> last crusade. He ended up being King Richard, <laughs> well, of course. And I didn't realize King Richard was Scottish. Yeah, I know. well, it's, <laughs> yeah, once again, you know, that's probably just a dialect of the region. Actually, he would have had a French accent. Yeah. He would have been, yeah, absolutely. They were all still speaking French at this time. Again, if you were a noble, if you were a Norman noble, you were speaking French. Yeah. So um, should we give should we give a quick um, overview of what the actual plot of the story is? We've kind of can I do that? Talked around. You can if you'd like. Yes. <laughs> Go for it. So Robin of Loxley starts off in the Middle East. He's on crusade, and he's about to have his hand cut off. Um, when he is manages to make a break for it, take his friend with him as well as a Muslim man uh, who named Azim, played by Morgan Freeman, who asks him to save him as he goes. And Robin Hood saying, no one deserves to die in this place, and he takes him with him. Now, his friend dies, he's shot, but Robin and Azim go back to uh, England and where Azim says, I'm going to follow you because I now owe you a debt. You saved my life, I must travel with you until I save yours. And so they buddy up. They go back to Loxley, find that Robin's castle has been taken. The sheriff of Nottingham is out of control. And eventually Robin heads to the forest, teams up with some goo- some dudes, forms a gang, gets back at the sheriff of Nottingham, uh, saves Marion, who's very feisty, if we can talk about Cheers. really amazing female role models. And, uh, yes, then there's big fights at the end and it's awesome. Morgan Freeman delivers an amazing monologue at the end where he urges everyone to rise up and fight the tyranny. And, you know, the women are involved in the, the rescue plan and Marion is a, oh, I mean, I was saving Sorry. that to the last, but Alan, <laughs> no, no, it's fine. Let's just get straight to him. Alan Rickman is so transformatively good in this movie. <laughs> Like yeah. he was, he and I was just reading up that he he didn't actually want to do it, but then they said, "Look, you can do whatever you want he with it." He turned it down twice, <laughs> and he just, my God! I mean, in terms of virtuoso acting, he is so so good, mm. and he's just, I like as a kid, I was so scared of him and so, but like entranced by him, mm. you know. I, I I hated him, but I also was like, "Oh, you're really interesting," and just. The humor, the I mean, yeah, the the the. He was really funny in this, and and even he's so funny. The lines that he says when you're a kid are funny, but when you're an adult, they're even funnier. Yeah, when he's talking to the prostitutes, <laughs> you, my room, ten thirty tonight, <laughs> you, ten forty five, and bring a friend. <laughs> yeah, it's just. As, yeah, as a kid, it's you're crazy. thinking, oh, he's going to get a lot of kisses. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he's so, so good. And, you know, oh, he's he just absolutely hams it up, but not in a destructive way. You know, he, he doesn't li- undermine the film. Yeah, he lifts the film yeah. to this amazing action adventure. And he just is such a good classic bad guy. And when Alan Rickman died, you know, and everyone, of course, was remembering him as, as um, Hans Snape. Gruber. Oh, Hans Gruber. And, and, as, oh, and yeah. as Snape, yeah. But for me, he was Sheriff of Nottingham. For me, that's who he was. And also Colonel Brandon in Sense and Sensibility, let's face it. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's right. And to a lesser extent, to a lesser extent, one of the many stupid people in Love Actually, which I have a very, 
<laughs> through through a weird twist of events, I now have a very close relationship with a film that I absolutely hate, Love Actually, because I've, I've developed a show about how much I hate it. Um, but oh, uh, Alan, <laughs> Alan Rickman is, to me, was the Sheriff of Nottingham, and that's who I lost when Alan Rickman died, was this incredibly mm. charismatic, you know, dark but humorous and self-aware and... and uh, Vain, you know the vanity when Robin cuts his thro- uh, cuts his cheek, and you mentioned it to start with, and, and he says, "I'm going to cut his heart out with a spoon." And his cousin yeah, yeah. says, "Why a spoon? Why not a knife?" You know, and he's oh, like, know. "Because it's dull, you twit. It'll <laughs> hurt <laughs> more." <laughs> and this is the thing with this film. Like, I, I, I watched, you know, I'll, I'll, and I'll give a bit of background of how I came to watch it so many times. But I have seen it so many times that it's like implanted in me. It's one of those ones where I, I can s- sing the theme tune. I can, if you play me a snippet, I know exactly which scene it is. Um, mm. You know, I can inflect every character's lines exactly how they say them. I can narrate along with it when I watch it. It's just, you know, but particularly the music. The music is like on a soundtrack in my head, and I will explain uh, why. It actually it lifts the film. I got to say, as soon as the music cut, actually, um, why don't we talk a bit about your background with it? Yeah, um, and then we'll hop straight into the acts because that's when I think we will really uh, we really get to talk about the craziness that is this film. Okay, so quick rundown. I was 10. We went on a family, like I think a two or two and a half month family um, vacation, holiday, time away in um, America and in the UK. And the reason for that was my dad um, was doing work training at sites in um, America and in Poland and in Southampton. So he, we turned this into kind of a big family trip away. So I was doing school work while we were away, but we're kind of traveling and, and doing projects and stuff. And we were staying with family, my mum's um, relatives in Ireland. And I had these two elder uh, cousins, one who was, I think, about 17, 18, and one who was 16. And the 18-year-old had just seen Robin Hood and loved it and was in love with Kevin Costner, you know. And she said, oh, we have to go see it. So she took us to the local cinema and we saw Robin Hood. And so because I, my cool older cousins had taken me to the cinema, you know, I was already kind of primed to like the film. And then to see it and to enjoy it and to just be overwhelmed with this wonderful historical action, adventure, great women in it, great, um, you know, just fantastic music, fantastic settings. I just fell in love with it. And then I saw it a second time a couple of weeks later when we were staying with other family in um, the UK, In sorry, in England. Um, so I saw it twice in a, num- a succession. And then we went to Poland where I bought a um, pirated copy of the soundtrack. Oh, okay. <laughs> so nice. um, Poland, for those who don't know, this is 1991. So the Iron Curtain has just come down really. And Poland was quite a bleak place still, but it was a a big hub for illegally recorded, you know, back in the day for you young folk when you used to pirate tapes. So you would have, um, you would have, you know, a cassette tape. Mm -hmm. And I remember going to a market and we bought two tapes. We bought Tina Turner, Simply the Best, (laughs) and we bought the Robin Hood Prince of Thieves soundtrack. (laughs) And so we had those tapes on repeat in our hire car as we drove around Poland and then Germany, you know, for two weeks. (laughs) And... I can still sing every, you know, line of Tina Turner. <laughs> That's the best. <laughs> and I can remember every inflection of, of that music from Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. I should point out the composer is Michael Kamen. He died about 15 or so years ago, but he did heaps and heaps of movies and he did um, The Three Weapon, Musketeers. Yeah. The th- did some great, great things. Just an amazing, amazing um, uh, musician and composer. That was a really and, good interview with him where he's talking about the music and saying that it's a work of love. This has come from the heart. I guess I was in love with Maid Marian and looking at Kevin <laughs> Costner, give her a big kiss and thinking, oh, ah, man, this is as close I'm going to get to that. That's great. And the thing is, and then he worked, of course, with Brian Adams to do, you know, everything I do, I do it for you, which was a huge mm-hmm. number one. It still is. You know, I went and saw Brian Adams in concert a few years ago. Wow. I was reviewing for Brisbane Times where I worked at the time and I just was, you know, oh, tell me you're not worth fighting. <laughs> like the little youngster in me was like, oh, it's the only kind of really soppy love ballad that I will it's get on It's a pretty perfect with. song, i got to say. It's, it's got a dreamy it's, voice. Yeah. It's just great. And um, uh, It's just that husky Die for yeah. you. Yeah. It's just the minor chord. It's so good. <laughs> and... 
you know, and that that music occasionally you'll hear the the overture from Robert Hood, the dun dun da 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 dun dun. Like occasionally I hear it used, you know, for backgrounds of football games or you know various incidental bits mm. of music. It sort of just gets pops up in the weirdest of places. It does. I've I, I actually had it stuck in my head for ages, and I knew and I hadn't watched this movie for a very long time, and I was trying to figure out where it was from. I'm like, oh, this film. I got. Well, what film is it that's got this music? Because it was going in my head over and over and over. And it was only until I watched this that I realized where it was from. Uh, Michael Kamen. It's so good. Well, I actually wanted to ask you, what's it like um, watching this movie in the UK? Well, you know, I was a kid. So it was, and it was 1991. So it was like, I guess, every other film. I remember we had wine gums in uh, Ireland and I remember that the there were lights in the cinema that kind of reflected bubbles on the ceiling I have a very strong memory of the Irish cinema and it was just a small cinema but the lights were so that it looked like the ceiling was a lava lamp how are the audience's reaction to it I don't remember I I mean I was so wrapped up in it I think everyone enjoyed it because we went with my parents Mm. and I remember my parents had enjoyed it my brother had and I just was in love with it you know and it it helped that these cool older cousins that I had also loved it I felt like I was cool like them you know (laughs) so it just it brings back so much for me and and one of the Mm. reasons why I I like it and I cling to it is that it just did so much that now people don't seem to give it credit for you know it people say oh it was a stupid movie but people love gritty reboots and it was a gritty reboot um for its time absolutely for its time it was and i I read a quote about roger ebert's review of it saying oh gee it would have been very disappointing for kids to it was so dark and dreary and whatnot and i was like i was the kid audience at the time and i loved it i loved that there was this menacing darkness with the sheriff of nottingham and and this kind of stuff um, I didn't get the subtext, the, the, the satanic worship subtext. It was such a surprise mm. to me in later years to come to it as an adult and go, oh, my God, there were so many more levels of, of that. Like I, I realised that they were, you know, devil worshippers, but I didn't realise how ingrained it was. And, yeah. um, you know, I was a kid and I loved it. I thought it was rousing. I thought it was full of passion and humour and... Um, it, you know, it had, I, I didn't care that Kevin Costner had an American accent. It didn't bother me. Oh, no, you know? absolutely not. <laughs> so. This is how the English speak when you're a kid. But it also it was Kevin Costner. It's a movie. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, I think I was self-aware enough to go, that's what he sounds like. I have this thing with a lot of creative stuff um, where generally I can suspend my disbelief. It, it takes mm. a lot. And I saw something, I saw a play recently, which um, I really disliked purely because there was one element of it to me that was just so out of the realms of possibility that I I just couldn't believe anything else. But that's rare for me. I'm normally quite happy to sit back and go, this is what they've decided has happened. I'm happy to go with it and not Mm. dissect it too much. Um, Mm. You know, it it had Morgan Freeman playing an Islamic man, uh, uh, Arabian man, I should say, Muslim, and they, were, they, they messed up a few things on the commentary. He talks about how he was praying, but with his hands in a clasped prayer, which, which Muslims don't do. They don't clasp their hands together like a Christian would pray. Um, so there were a few little details like that that they didn't get right. But, like, how nice was it to go, let's bring in a character with a totally different world experience? I think they were inspired by another show to do that. But, you know, to actually bring someone in and have that whole dialogue of, oh, my God, he's a black man and what do we... You know, he's a Muslim. And- Do you think in this day and age they would have introduced that character? Um, well, they probably they probably would have had to get a an actual Arab man, not an African American. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's certainly the case. You know what? But to me, that did, to me that was great to actually see a different face on screen. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I, I'm just thinking that nowadays. Do you think that they would include a Muslim in there? In the film and embrace it as a as community and it's hard to tell isn't it it's it's yeah. it's really i mean this is a different podcast and i i don't have that much time but um you know to even talk about uh what's appropriate and stuff like that is really difficult and um mm. you know what is right and i think now um you know maybe there would be a bit more pressure to go oh, bring in a, an actual Arabian man, you know, someone from the, mm. the, the actual location of an African-American. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, uh, y- you know, I, I think that if you're, you know, I think that if you're a, an, a person of Asian extraction that you, why can't you play 
uh, if you're Chinese, why can't you play Japanese, Korean, you know, why not? Like I'm a white woman from Australia, but if I'm on stage, I could conceivably be a Russian or a, a Scottish person mm. or a New Zealand, a white New Zealander or a white English person. Or, but, you know, so I kind of think like narrowing everyone down to you can only be from the country you're from is kind of yeah. is kind of restrictive and not very fair so i think it's the reasoning behind it more than anything else i think uh i think yeah it's it's fine in those situations it's when the reasoning for it yeah. is is and, of yeah, some and other the, purpose the, the whole point of the azim character is to show the english people up for being prejudiced and judgmental and he's shown as being the more tolerant and the more educated and wise person and in many ways the more technologically advanced. You know, he's using gunpowder and telescopes and um, he's kind of the cue of the operation, you know. He's, mm. um, it's, he's, and, and he challenges people. He saves a woman who's in childbirth and has a breech position. Mm. So he saves her life by knowing how to perform oh, a cesarean. I, I consider him as the MVP of the film. Yeah, he definitely <laughs> is. And um, he and Maid Marian, so they're, they're kind of given agency and they're given um, responsibility and they're given depth and... So I don't see how that is any kind of tokenism when he's, if 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 not for him, Robin would not have made it. You know that was the that's the key point. And they oh, he a was an incredibly strong character yeah. in this film, and he made the film in so many so many ways. He added he added a, a level of depth that you wouldn't have gotten had he not been there. Yeah, exactly. I and feel. it just made it rather than an all white. Let's get mad. It, it brought the the crusades. It brought it home. It made it a bit more real. Um, you know, his Azim's what his crime had been was loving a woman uh, who whom he shouldn't have, and so you know that was something that he and Robin then had in common was loving a woman that they weren't supposed to. You know, so mm. um, yeah, it was. Uh, I don't know. I'm biased, so I'm, of course I'm going to defend it. Um, but I just think it gets so much <laughs> flack for what it is, and uh, you know, I I just don't see how you can see. I, don't know. I agree. I, I agree. Look, watching the, watching this again, and I haven't seen it for years. I was surprised how much I enjoyed it. it so much came flooding back to me as soon as the music played. Yes. And uh, and actually, the when the beginning of this film started, um, it actually gave me the t- uh, an alternative title for the film, which was Bedknobs and Broomsticks: The Prequel. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> because. If you look at Bed Knobs and Broomstick, it starts with that whole pattern of, you know, of the of the British and you, you know those tapestries. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, when I saw when I saw this again, um, I was surprised at how much I enjoyed it and how much it didn't suck because it it had a, a lot of positive messages to it. It had those little gaps in it and silliness to it that um, that I think nowadays you should be more than happy to forgive considering the the quality of some of the characters and acting of so alan rickman certainly makes his film um and uh kevin costner is fine as a leading man uh i i thought that the nudity scene was a bit unnecessary oh i love that <laughs> but, as a girl i was like that's did you, his bum <laughs> well, that, did you know what it's not it's a stunt bum <laughs> yes but i didn't know that <laughs> But um, but yeah, no. It, 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 this is great. Well, Derek, what did you? Wow, what did I you thought Costner's Robin was very likable, and you can see that he gave it his all in this role with regards to the epic mm. stunts and his general enthusiasm. But he was like an Oscar-winning director, as you say, by this point. But mm. he's still playing around with mm. bows and falling in the mud, so he doesn't really let let that get to him. But Alan Rickman definitely showed stole the show for me. He's so yeah. good. He's just, as I say, he's just transformative. Like. Um, every time he's on screen, it's just electric, you know, he's, 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 it turns creepy and, you know, he kind of sleezes onto Marion and then he's just rude. And, and then there's that amazing sequence where, you know, Robin Hood is stealing from the rich, giving to the poor. Um, and so he's super popular and, and the sheriff is offering more and more money for a ransom and he can't get it. No one wants to turn him in. And, uh, and his aide says, it's the people, sir. They love him. And he just <laughs> he just yes. explodes with volcanic rage and yeah. he throws yeah. this cup off the table, just slams it off the table. 
and says, uh, you know, uh, he, he goes into a big diatribe and says, that's it. Cancel the kitchen scraps for orphans. No more merciful beheadings. And then he gets to the door. The music sort of stops and he says, and call off Christmas, <laughs> slams the door. And this is this such a good moment. And the reason I say the line is, um, and call off Christmas, because so many people misquote that and say, cancel Christmas. And it's one of those weird oh, things right. where I get a bit OCD. And I go, no, 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 it's call off call Christmas. Off Christmas. <laughs> Apparently, I read some trivia that he had the help of Ruby Wax and playwright Peter Barnes to help edit the script for his dialogue. Really? That's oh, yeah. great. So, so they added some of those lines because it was, before apparently pretty terrible yeah well that makes a lot of sense (laughs) and i'd actually Um, renamed we don't have time to go through the axe i think but i'd renamed the axe in the perspective of the sheriff of nottingham so oh promoted to sheriff it feels like my life is now beginning by an act three (laughs) i'm to be married happily ever after knock on wood (laughs) (laughs) he's he's the movie for me alan rickman oh my gosh And then he's fighting at the end. So this, you know, and again, as a kid, I didn't quite get what was happening. So he is attempting to force himself on Marion. So he's married. He's got his devil worshipping priest to marry them. And she's saying, you know, no, I do not. And he's saying, yes, of course she does. You know, and then he's (laughs) stripping her clothes off her. She's struggling. And, and he does because the, the witch has said, you need to take apart. her now. Yeah. He says, you need yeah. to take her now. She's ripe. She'll give us a son. And, um, and it's really it, quite it's, at all. It's so really, I was thinking, it's how really this... confronting. But then she's saying, you may take yeah. my, my body, but you won't take me. You won't take me. It won't be me. And then Robin comes in to save her. So it's really brutal. Um, but it is again, brutal, as a but kid, it's also, it's, it's so, uh, it is brutal, but there's parts of it that's so funny. Like it's she, so funny. she yeah, hits they, Marion the, and he goes, Hey, that's my wife, yeah, bro. Exactly, exactly, you know. <laughs> I won't take her until we're properly married. married. You know, he's trying to have this um, bizarre legitimacy to his life. You know, he says, for once in my life, I will have something pure. Do you understand? You know, and it's 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 this wonderful vulnerability of that character to want yeah, to be an evil yeah. villain but kind of hate himself for it. And the other thing that is kind of revealed... With all those extra scenes, which was never in the original, is the fact that Mortiana, the crone, the witch, is his mother. His mother. So that's what's revealed, and that she swapped him as a baby. So, um, and that was just when I saw that, I just went, "Whoa!" My mind exploded. You know, yeah. I just crazy. It gives so much depth because he um, gives that line to the child earlier that he never knew his parents. He never knew his mother. He never knew my parents. So, and he, so she kind of swapped him out because she was obviously a witch, but she wanted him to do better. So she kind of nurtured him from the side as this witch of his, but never revealed the truth. And 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 then you think, oh my God, he's is it nature v nurture? You know, he's the son of a witch. Is he bad because his blood is bad, or is he bad because he never actually just got a decent upbringing? you know so there's just all this stuff to it that delights me and every time I see you know the character of little John is great he's a great little John oh he's great wasn't he and his wife is equally as important you know his wife Fanny Mm. and at the end when he's like uh you know they've only got about seven people to carry out this um raid on on uh Marion's wedding to the sheriff and stop a hanging and, you know, the big she final says, fight. I've given birth to eight babies. Eight babies. <laughs> and I'm not going to let one of them die. Yeah. And John says, go back, woman. You know, you need to look after the other seven. And he says, tell her, Rob, tell her, Robin. And Robin says, Fanny, you'll take up position here. And and it's just like done. And Very and that's, empowering. I mean, that's allyship. That's what we want. <laughs> you know, we're talking about with all me too now, we're all constantly talking about men going, yep, we need the women to be, to be engaged. Yep. They're capable. He just goes, she is capable. Yeah, and I like it how it's done where it's not a it's not an antagonistic type thing where in order to be equal she has to be better or in yeah. order to be it's in order to be she it's is just a, that they're all into it together. She is a middle aged woman who's had eight children in the year eleven ninety four. You know, she is not freaking Buffy or Xena. She is a regular woman who is given a key role in taking down the operation of the sheriff. And those mm. kinds of things stuck with me. Just that that wonderful. Mm. And look, 
don't get me wrong. I love a kick-ass woman. I, I Xena, Warrior Princess, if you ever want to do a TV show kind of important thing, I'd love to talk to you about Xena for I you know years. Too, yeah. <laughs> so, so great. <laughs> what I loved about Xena is that she didn't have superpowers. She was a woman. She was an ordinary woman who trained. And that is why I always say Xena is better, better than Buffy because Buffy had superpowers. Mm-hmm. Uh, Xena didn't. She was not the daughter of a god. She wasn't a god herself. She was just a really freaking kick-ass woman. And that's why I also like Brienne of Tarth in Game of Thrones. She's a kick-ass woman. Mm. But I also, and I have a big, I do recaps of Game of Thrones. They're a thing. So I have a big thing about Game of Thrones. And one of the reasons I love Game of Thrones, <laughs> I think, is because it reminds, you know, so much of this lovely medieval stuff that I love. And, and it goes back to, to Robin Hood. Um, but I, ha- I had a Game of Thrones thing for this as well, where, you know, where he's standing, he's waiting to see Marion for the first time in yes. a long time. And the lady walks out. All I could think of was one of Walter Frey's wives. Oh, okay. yes. uh, <laughs> and he's and is taken aback. Oh, the years have been kind. So true. Exactly. The years have been kind. And then who is it who actually fights him? It's Marion in a knight's outfit. And the thing is, she's not fantastic. She's good. She gets him by surprise. So she's able to kind of best him for a while. But eventually he's got more strength and he's able to get the, the dagger out of her hand and realizes it's her. So she's... She's not kicking ass and taking names, but she's making, she's defending herself. So I just yep. loved these women who were, and the other way she was defending herself was by manipulating the sheriff. He kept saying, bring your household into, into the castle, you know, come, come under my protection. And she was like, no, 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 the king will come back. He's my cousin. I'm fine. So she was mm. working the political side of things. And that's what I really liked about it. I liked that it showed women in realistic settings and yes, they were doing a bit of kick-assing, but in a realistic world. Because the thing about the medieval world and why people hate Game of Thrones for some of its depictions of women, but in that kind of world, and Game of Thrones is a fantasy world, I get it's different, but in that kind of brutal world, not every woman is going to be Xena or Buffy and kick-ass every time. Shit, mm. Bad shit's going to happen to women. And I like to see that because I like to see how they then survive it and get over it and get revenge mm. or get or get a win. That's what I want to see. Well, how, how can you represent the history of what has occurred for women if you don't depict some of the aspects that are actually true to the times as well? It, I, yeah, to me, trying to hide the idea that women wouldn't be um, treated terribly is is just, you know, not oh, whitewashing is not the right term, but it's just, it's just kind of watercoloring it, the, the reality. It's a disservice yeah, to and I'm, what's actually I'm happened. I'm not trying to suggest we need to show depictions of terrible violence against women every single no. time. And I do understand that, that that is problematic and risky. I do understand that. But I don't like glamorizing it. And, and people think that, oh, if I was a queen in a previous time, I would have been a lady, I would have had a lovely life. And it's like, no, you would have been a peasant woman who had to give babies, mul- you know, run a farm. You, 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 we don't get to be queens lounging on lounges, you know. And this is what I loved about is, is it showed women, get, you know, Maid Marian sends her assistant off to help deliver a letter to Richard to try and get him word of what Nottingham was doing. And, right, so she sends her assistant off with the messenger and he then you know slams her over the head and they arrest her and take her into custody she doesn't win she 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 not through no fault of her own she gets undermined and i like that i like seeing that i like seeing that women tried and failed and then sometimes they tried and won and so i'm getting a bit passionate and now. even and <laughs> even then she no no it's great uh, she is a and even even though she might get overpowered she does represent herself as a strong character nonetheless yeah it's not her fault she's not weak because a guy tricked her and then knocked her over the head you know and then she gets arrested and and pulled into uh into jail with a whole bunch of other people as the sheriff tells marion you've got to marry me or else i'm going to have all these people killed Mm -hmm. so and marion does what she thinks she has to do to save people which is marry this guy she's not happy about it she's just forced into a corner so she's trying to work out you you can't tell me that marion wouldn't have found a way to poison the sheriff or, you know, like she would have found yeah, a way yeah. to try and dispatch him at some point. Unfortunately, that's where our podcasting software cracked it. So once again, we're really sorry for the technical difficulties. And thanks so much for your support and patience with us. To finish off, we'll lead out with a recording of Pierce Brosnan's speech at the end of the making of Robin Hood, as it summarizes our feelings towards this incredible film. 
Amidst the darkest glades of Sherwood Green, in the deepest part of the wood, some say can still be seen the ghost of Robin Hood. So, did Robin Hood really exist? Do we really want to know, after all, if it were to be proven that he did not exist? And that has never been proven. Who would fight for the underdog? Who would wage war against corruption and tyranny? Who would prove that chivalry is not dead? Robin was not only a celebrity, but also a character of mystery. He lives on in our children and in our children's children. 800 years ago, in a dark forest in medieval England, there lived a hero, a man so remarkable that his name and his story became a legend, a legend that will live on forever. And tomorrow night, with the premiere of Robin Hood, the Prince of Thieves, Kevin Cosner will be the next to string the bow, ignite our imaginations and continue the legacy. Long live Robin Hood. I'm Pierce Brosnan. Good night. We'd also like to thank our very special guest, Natalie Behensky. You can find her at Girl Clumsy on Twitter, Patreon and SoundCloud and Natalie's Throne on Facebook. Facebook.